Hello, I'm Duryadhan Hawk, aka Daya. I'm an Indonesian Pakistani non binary lesbian. Hello, I'm Marianne Salem, aka Mary. I'm a Lebanese Aboriginal bisexual woman. We are two writers who love movies, television, and books, especially when they're gay. And welcome to Gay V Club, where we'll be analysing LGBT texts that we like, that we don't like, and how we relate to these texts as gay people of colour. Yay! Welcome to the second episode of Volume 3. Thanks for everyone for listening to us so far. You know the drill, if you like AV Club, which I'm assuming you do because you're already here, but please like, subscribe, rate, tell your friends, leave a nice review wherever you listen to podcasts. And our Twitter and Instagram handle is at gayv underscore club. Also, we have a Patreon and a PayPal. So if you'd like to support them, we are at paypal.me slash gayvclub and also patreon.com slash gayvclub. Yeah, check those out if you're interested in any of those things. Um, yes, understandable if not, but that's fine. We hope people are safe and you've been spending your quarantine being safe. And Yeah. Yeah, so today on Gay v Club, we're going to be talking about Alice Wu's new coming-of-age film, The Half of It, which just dropped on Netflix, starring Leo Lewis, Daniel Diemer, and Alexis Lemire. Alice Wu is an Asian-American lesbian filmmaker whose first film, Saving Face, from 2004, is the first rom-com with an all-Asian cast made in America, and was for a long time regarded as the seminal film for Asian lesbians. Crazy rich Asians out here, like, we're the first thing. No, you're not. Go be no, quiet in your corner. But yeah, Alice Wu is now back uh, 15 years later with this new film, The Half of It, which is a Cyrano adaptation where Chinese American teen Ellie Chu, who lives in a very small, very white, very conservative town. Squirrel uh, Hamish. Agrees- Squirrel Hamish, yes. Yes. She agrees to help a jock named Paul from her high school in writing love letters to another girl named Aster. Big, big Paul stands. Big yes. Big Paul stands. Big Ellie Chu stands. Big, yeah, big, big, big the half of it stands. Of, yeah, big half of it stands. <laughs> like, we stand everyone in this movie. Everyone. Mm-hmm. Even that yeah. dude, even that dumbass who, who thinks Ellie is in love with him when Can he's I just never ask, spoken like, to her. What is, is Trick short for something? The whole time I was like, who names their child trigonometry? <laughs> Literally me too. I was thinking maybe, is, is it short for Patrick? Maybe? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Trig? I have no idea. Okay. Tr- Triglifer. <laughs> okay. But yeah, we love the movie. <laughs> We love this movie. I guess you could say the Asian Wallawa community has been waiting over 15 years for this movie. It's really good. I'm happy she got to make another film. And it shouldn't have been this long between films, but we all yeah. know why. I think she also works in the tech industry, so she's what not do you just mean? a filmmaker. What do you mean by the tech industry? What does that mean? Alice, Alice Wu, I don't know what she does, but it was like a thing. Like She left her really high-paying job in the tech industry that I don't know anything about, like just so that she could make Saving Face. All those years ago, actually. Man, I love hearing stories like that. Mm. But anyway, so, Dee, as for this podcast, the in-resident Asian Woolawa, what are your general thoughts on this movie? Um... I loved it. It was very, it was very sweet and very, even though I'm not of East Asian descent, there were so many things that I could just relate to. It's such a specific film. From its premise, it doesn't really seem like it needs to be this specific, but it's just really nice that it is. With the setting, with her background, and with also the intertextuality, which I guess we're going to talk about a bit later. I love Ellie Chu. She's played by Leah Lewis. She's introduced as being this really smart character who helps other students in her school, I ghost writing essays for them. I remember the first thing I thought when this concept was introduced to me is like, I thought of Bad Genius, which is another movie that I really like. Bad Genius is a Thai film. It's like probably the best academia film about a student and she helps other people cheat in school. Yeah, I think that character, Lynn, I think she was a lesbian, even though it's not explicitly stated. So definitely give it a watch. Do you think Alice Wu saw that movie and, and made this as a homage I don't think so, because Ellie Chu is supposed to be Cyrano. I think Bad Genius is a little bit too amped up. But yeah, Ellie Chu is just, I love her. She's my daughter. (laughs) I love when characters are funny in a way that they're like not intended to be funny. She's so gay. 
she's so gay. <laughs> when she's drunk and she's like, I am monitoring the situation. Something that I love about this film as well is that the characters that are teenagers actually seem like teenagers. As someone who spends days with teenagers, I can tell you that they do actually act much more like teenagers than the average film that features teenagers. Have you actually explained on this podcast that you're like a high school teacher? Um, I don't think I don't know so. if you <laughs> Just for context. For context. <laughs> for context. Um, because that's such a weird thing to say. For context of my life and for me talking about teenagers like I have some authority, I am a high school teacher, which is why you'll hear me say on this podcast that I work with teenagers a lot because I do, because that's how I make my money and spend a lot of my time. So yes, I'm a high school teacher. I teach English. Also, shout out to this movie. It has a good English teacher. Which is yes. nice. And yeah, that's why if you hear me say things like that, that's why I say it. Because I am a teacher. Next we have Paul. <laughs> <gasps> Paul. The notes that I have put for Paul is that Himbo King and also the most emotionally intelligent character. He is though. He is. He is. I'm thinking you know, about it now. I think all the good himbo characters often are the most emotionally intelligent characters in whatever yeah, they're Yeah, because in. what they lack in academic smarts, they make up in heart smarts. Like Jason in The Good Place. Yeah. 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 And all the other himbo kings, like mm. Steve Harrington's. Steve Harrington is, is bi and we I love him, my son. Mm -hmm. But yes, no, Paul is the best. I just love all the scenes in this movie between Paul and Ellie's dad. Does Ellie's dad have a name? Mr. Chu? Mr. Chu and Paul, all the scenes between them are gold, pure gold. Paul is an aspiring chef and his family run the, what is it, like a... It's a like a sausage factory, like a place. butcher. Yeah, yeah, something um, like that. His, his family obviously have been in the town for generations, and Paul he wants to change the recipe because he has a brand new idea for what he calls a taco sausage. Also, for mm -hmm. the record, like he talks about this through the movie. Don't watch this movie on empty stomach like I did because you'll just come out being like, I just want a taco sausage. And the worst part is you have no idea what a taco sausage actually is, what it tastes like. But anyway, there are all these adorable, wholesome scenes when Paul keeps telling Ellie about the taco sausage he's created and how it's delicious, and Ellie, like, refuses to try it. But then there's this scene where he makes a taco sausage for Ellie's dad, and Ellie's dad tries it, and he thinks it's delicious. And so she tries it, and she's like, oh my gosh, this is great. And it's so, so wholesome. I just have how Paul... Paul is, is given everyone his yummy food and it's, it's so sweet. And it's just really sad because in a way you want Paul to be with Asta just because he seems to want it so much, you know? Even mm. though you know that Asta doesn't really like him. Does that make sense? Just because I guess so. you know, Paul is, is doing all this stuff. I don't mean it like in in that misogynistic way of like, oh, well, he put all this effort in so he should have her. But it's like... It just seems to be the thing that will make he so happy. But yeah, all the scenes between him and Asta, you can tell he's really trying. Um, he wants to really be this guy, but he's not. Even though he's he's so emotionally intelligent, he just doesn't gel with Asta for obvious reasons. Asta Flores is the pastor's daughter, and she's the girl that Paul is in love with because she's pretty and smart, as he states. In the, in the beginning of the movie, he writes a really terrible love letter, which he asks Ellie to, I guess, rewrite or edit for him. And she agrees because she's she's low on money. So the whole movie is like Ellie kind of ghostwriting for Paul in this way and developing an intellectual and emotional bond with Aster. You could also say that Ellie and Aster are both culturally isolated, just in different ways, and that Ellie and her father are obviously the only Asians in the town. And Aster is from like the third or second generation Latinx family. Because you, when you're the only other person of color in a situation, you sort of automatically 
you just know the other person. Yeah. I think she's also pretty isolated just because her dad is the pastor. I feel like if you're the pastor's daughter in a town that is very religious, there's a lot of pressure on you and people probably form a certain idea about you that would also isolate you from everyone else. One of my favourite bad cheesy teen movies, and it is really cheesy. I don't know, have you seen this movie? It's called A Walk to Remember. Uh, No, I haven't seen this. Is that a Nicholas Sparks movie? It is... I'm pretty sure it is actually, but it's about, <laughs> essentially is a Nicholas Sparks movie, even if it's not a Nicholas Sparks movie, if you know what I mean. It is a Nicholas, based on a Nicholas Sparks novel. There you I go. I just googled it. Well, there you go. Anyway, this movie is is about the, I was obsessed with this movie when I was 13. I watched it every day for a year. I don't even know why. Who's in it? Were you gay for Mandy Moore or something? Maybe. Maybe on a subconscious level. I don't know. Mm. I really honestly can't tell you why. I just love I still have the DVD in my room. Okay. I'm looking at it right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, maybe it was Mandy Moore because I used to like – there's this scene in this, that movie that I was specifically obsessed with and it's like she's dressed in like this very silky gown because they're having – they're putting on a play, I think, and mm. she takes her cloaky cape off and her hair is all like beautifully done and – and she's wearing this silky dress, and I was like, wow, she's so beautiful. So maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe so. But anyway, in that movie, she's the town preacher's daughter, and, you know, it's one of those bad boy falls in love with the preacher's daughter kind of movies. <laughs> and she talks about how, like, everyone expects me to be so good. And, and she is. That's the thing, though. She's actually, like, a perfect squeaky clean person i don't know that's how nicholas sparks subverts the genre he's like the priest's daughter (laughs) it's like the priest's daughter actually secretly isn't like wild she's actually a perfectly wholesome person um subversion but anyway yeah i don't know i just felt like maybe there was a homage to that in this okay because that movie is also about the suffocating of small townness and and I also like with the cultural isolation. I feel like this movie portrays the isol the simultaneous isolation and suffocation you feel of being in a small town or a small city, where everyone knows each other and everyone goes to the same places. I feel like this movie captures that really well and how that makes everyone sort of not talk to each other. The setting is really strong. Yeah, the setting is very much an important part of this movie. It's very much as much a character. It actually defines all these people in a very specific way. And I I really like the way that the movie uses setting. It's not just, oh, we're setting it in a small town because it's interesting to set it in a small town. No, this is very much what it is to live in a small town and and be a person of colour and also be gay and everyone knows everyone else's business and it's very stressful you know the bit where she says like thanks for meeting me here i didn't want my dad to find out or it's very small towny i liked it Mm. i like that about it and how everyone in the town is isolated in their own way because being in a small town is isolating within itself even poorly even my boy paul all he wants to do is make a new kind of sausage and he can't because it's been the same sausage recipe for generations yeah. But as I said to you, I think when I rang you the other night after I watched it, I love that Ellie lives in a train station. I think yeah. that's so cool. It's like an old timey train station. I know that it's painted in a very bittersweet light, the fact that they live in a train station, but I think that's kind of cool, honestly. All right. So let's talk about direction. Yeah. I remember you made a comment to me about Netflixisms. And, like, how Netflix movies kind of look all the same. Yeah. And I disagree. In the case of this movie, I disagree. It's, like, a bit of both, I think. The direction is really pragmatic in this movie, and it's really skillful. Oh, I don't think it's not skillful. I just think that Netflix makes movies have a certain uniformity Mm. to them. You know how Netflix, everything has to be centered? Yeah. So they can crop it? For yeah. ads easier, that's what I meant. Mm-hmm. 
It's That's just fair. something that you can't help but notice in the way that everything's shot. And I just mean that Netflix movies have a uniformity in that sense, that you can tell they're made for a certain medium, which is fine because yeah. that's how things are. I think with this kind of way, it does limit directors in how they can film things. Mm -hmm. It means that every shot has to be like so, so clean in a way that, I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's like it doesn't have a texture. Like it seems I don't know, very maybe sanitized. Yeah, you know, because yeah. everything has to be centred in a way that they can crop it easily to make it an, into an ad or make it into a Twitter video or make it into something. So, I guess so. Yeah, that's what I meant. I didn't actually mean that it was bad. I just meant in – I think it actually probably gives directors less freedom about what they can and can't put into a shot. Yeah, that's but fair. Anyway. No, no, I was no, going to say, say think, what you um, want to say. Yeah, though, I do think, even though this is definitely true, and, like, you do kind of, it's very easy to get that vibe while watching it, there's absolutely, like, a lot of craftsmanship in this anyway, which I think is quite unique. Yeah. Netflix has a podcast called Watching With, there, where they get the directors or writers of their original movies to basically create a director's commentary, and Alice Wu did do one, and I listened to that, and, um... Yeah, it was a very interesting director's commentary. It was very different to most director's commentaries that I've listened to before because she was very focused on the technical and like basically justifying every every decision that she made. She never once mentioned anything about like making things so Netflix wanted to. Every decision seemed very symbolic. It felt very English teachery in that way, kind of. Ooh. Like it was very it was very explanatory, that commentary, which was nice. And there were there were nice comments throughout anyway. So yeah, if you do like the movie and you interested in filmmaking i still think it's very nice to see i don't think that half of it feels as sanitized as other netflix movies in fact i don't even think most netflix movies are even are that sanitized i feel like if you changed nothing about this movie except had the a24 logo smacked on top of it people would be having very different conversations about the direction and be like oh this is so atmospheric and controlled but like because this is netflix and alice Wu is a lesser known non-white non-male filmmaker it's dismissed as like a lower form of art and no one wants to pay attention to the direction even though i know you don't mean it in a bad way lining things up in the middle and making your shots symmetrical isn't even a bad thing when wes anderson does it people go crazy and even if the purpose is to help the people who prepare the marketing material crop it easily like you can you still end up with a really beautifully staged film i don't even think the movie is that symmetrical anyway it's just shot very carefully and the cinematography is very warm and and there's a very nice intimacy to this film which i think is rare i rewatched saving face recently and i have to say the half of it is actually so much better. There's definitely this sense of absolute control. Like, it's very meticulous and pragmatic. Like, Alice, she just had this in the bag, even though it's only her second film, and even though she had a 15-year hiatus from directing. I said to you, because we were talking about this with Desiree as well, and mm. you feel that with Cameron Post as well, but I yeah. feel like for Desiree and for Alice, they're women. Not only are they women, but they're women of color, and they're also both gay. I don't think they have the room that, say, a straight white male director would to just yeah. be like, "Oh, this is my second film. I can just make mistakes, and if I do my best." Like, no, they have to actually like because I feel like they have to be ready to justify everything they're going to do anyway, mm. and that's why those movies, especially their first movies, first movies are feral because they've got yeah. to be to get notice, and then second movies are meticulous, because yeah. you have to prove that you you deserve this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's actually quite beautiful, because it means yeah. that you make these very careful and, and thoughtful films. I don't know. I don't want to compare them, because I feel like Saving Face and, and half of it are made for two very different audiences. Yeah, absolutely. And so I don't think there's a value in going, this one's better, but... You know, technically, I can see that Alice Wu has grown a lot, and I love to see it. I love mm -hmm. to see it. I love yeah. to see a director, like, growing in the course of yeah. their work. And was there any, like, really cool things that she mentioned in the commentary? No, just, like, your standard thing. I think something that she – there's the whole thing about lines in the movie, the way that the shots would be kind of divided to show them 
like being on separate sides and things. And there was a really fun moment where she's talking about the diner scene and you know how it's like two te different text conversations happening at once and like everyone telling her that she wouldn't work. She's like, no, I was going to do the one car Y flip, zipping from one end of the screen to the other. And she actually did do that and it worked really well. Um, so that was like a cute detail and I like that, that she referenced that specifically. And also there's a lot of stuff that I didn't notice on the first watch like kind of the way that the duration of the shots would set the pacing and like the intimacy of of certain scenes and it's really nice to listen to it is really beautiful and i love the color palette mm. especially there's a lot because of green in the movie there's a lot of cool colors but the way they're presented to you is in a really warm way mm. this is a really warm film this is just such a wholesome lovely film even though it's got this love letter aspect to it like it's ultimately about friendship and i love movies like that it's about yeah. all the different kinds of love that are in our lives yes it's about all the different kinds of love because there are so many and i love that their relationship between ellie and paul because they're just two baby 15 year olds who are like they don't know what love is and they're trying to learn how to articulate that and the way that it's written like the script is so good because you really get that sense that this is definitely being told from a young person's perspective Yes, yes. I especially love this. I was telling you about this, how I love the scenes where Aster is talking about how she feels about being a part of that group of friends and how she talks about how when you're pretty, no one wants you, you to like them. They want you to be like them because it makes mm. them feel pretty. And when you're watching the scene, the four other girls want her to wear the scarf and they all look the same. They all have the identical scarf with the identical hair and the identical outfit. And you can tell watching that scene that this is obviously not what actually happens. These girls don't actually wear the identical thing, but that's how Asta feels. And mm. I really like how you feel this is what Asta is seeing and this is what she's feeling. So in those moments, you more feel what she's feeling rather than yeah. just see it, yeah, which is really cool. I love movies that actually use perspective to show perspective rather than just showing the character. With your, you know, they're fifteen years old and they're, they're babies and mm -hmm. they don't and they don't really know what these things. That's why yeah. I like that it doesn't end with them being together because I'm yes. like, you're babies. You don't know. I know. Hey. This is a coming-of-age movie. I think a coming-of-age story requires just one thing for it to be good, and it's the ending needs to feel like a beginning. Oh my gosh, that's the best thing ever. I think it's weird that if you, like, for them to end up together, like, it feels very final. Even though there is that soulmate allegory, Greek mythology allegory, you don't meet the love of your life when you're that. Like, you need room to grow, and I like that the ending gives them all that, you know? I don't know if Ellie and Astra are soulmates. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't think they are. I think that they helped each other understand that that was possible, mm. but I don't know if they actually are. And I think that's yeah. why the ending is really good, because they don't know what they might be to each other in the future, but they know that they'll they'll mm -hmm. remember that moment of their whole of their lifespan. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and how they spent it together and that's more important than continuing it i love the premise of these kids writing love letters but they don't really know what love is and like you have ellie in the beginning referencing a lot of the media that she's seen in order to kind of work that out for her so there's a lot of intertextuality throughout the movie like a lot of references to other texts which i love i especially love that in the first meeting scene with Astra and Ellie, it's like she's dropped her Remains of the Day book, which is a novel by Kazuo Ishiguro. And it felt like so specific to me watching that because it's like, yes, I love this author so much. Like I'm not a super Remains of the Day fan. I'm more of a Never Let Me Go person, but it felt so specific to watch this movie because they're all, it's like the first thing they do is reference this repressed literature. It's really cute that the movie has that. And then throughout the movie, you see Ellie and her dad watching some movies together. The first movie that they watch together is Casablanca and it's really cute because this is like after she's agreed to meet with Paul and they're watching the final scene which is obviously like you know this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship and I think that's really cute and hmm. they were the only references that I got were the Casablanca <laughs> references <laughs> okay because I very hard relate to sitting with with your dad and watching mm -hmm. 
Casablanca. Um, my dad's favorite movie is Casablanca. When I watched that scene in the movie, I was like, "Oh, this is a this is a wider this is a wider ethnic experience." I didn't realize. <laughs> but but yeah, I I have watched Casablanca many times because it's my dad's favorite movie, and I've watched it with him, and so I got all the Casablanca references, and I really loved that. Um, yeah, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yes, that Very is essentially so. the vibe of this whole movie. And like all the other movies that they watch, they all have triangles in the same way that this movie has triangle, like with oh, with yes. Ellie, Paul, and Aster. Like all that, like you know, they've got their golden trios. Another film that's referenced is Wings of Desire by Vin Vanders. That's a. I don't know if you'd like this film, Mary, but it's a really. I really love this film. It's about an angel who falls in love with a human but she can't see him oh. and like, like she can't hear him. But I think it's a nice little metaphor as well for the feeling of being a closeted gay person as well and liking someone. So yeah, that's a really nice detail. And there are lots of really nice homages to Wings of Desire throughout the movie as well that I like. I think I like the intertextuality because it's kind of a stress on wanting to see representation or like, especially when you're gay, like finding little pieces of subtext that you relate to. The stuff that's like very explicitly gay is it feels like it's it's either inaccessible or it's too much for you. Like even it's, Casablanca has loads of queer subjects in it. Also, they they're watching Ek Villain, <laughs> which is a Bollywood movie. Like the scene where where they're watching an Indian movie of a guy chasing after a girl in the train. I think just the trope of you know someone you love disappearing on a train or a bus or something and you never see them again. It's like my favorite trope in the movie. And this movie does it really well, but I love that they make fun of it. And it's really funny to me that they chose Ek Villain. <laughs> I just think it's funny because there are so many Bollywood movies that you could have chosen <laughs> as well. <laughs> but you chose that one. Any other thoughts on the intertextuality? Um, this film made me feel like a bad English teacher because I didn't know a lot of the books that they mentioned, <laughs> or except for Casablanca, I hadn't seen... Mm. Or I didn't recognize any of the films. So if nothing else, the movie gave me a very interesting recommendation list. So uh, that's that's my thoughts. I mean, I, I could recognize there was a lot of intertextuality, but I wasn't familiar enough with the text being references to fully appreciate it. But, but I still appreciated what I was seeing, had a lot of thought into it. I think the way Alice Wu did it also made it obvious, even if you hadn't seen those movies you know how Ellie and Paul are watching the train scene and yeah. she says, oh, she's crying like a moron. <laughs> she says, like, if you ran after someone on a train, it just means you're a moron. And yeah. he says, but, you know, she's crying. It's like, well, she's a moron too. So it's made at the end when she's mm -hmm. on the train and she's crying after Paul has run after her and she's like, moron. You know, so I yeah. think even if, if you haven't seen the movies, the way Alice Wu does it is is very lovely because it doesn't make you feel you, like you have anyway. Yeah, you feel like you have and you feel like you get the important part. She's not like looking down on you going, well, if you haven't seen this film, you won't understand. So I liked, I appreciated that. But yeah, I don't have a lot to say on the intertextuality because I hadn't seen a lot of the th or read a lot of the things. Makes me want to read Remains of the Day, though. Yeah, no, that's interesting because like I I only saw Wings of Desire for the first time because my English teacher put it on for wow. extension one though. Nick Cave is in that movie. It's really fun. <laughs> you you like Nick Cave? I do like Nick Cave. Anyway, <laughs> I just want to say on a side note, I don't want to make a big point of it, but I love that Ellie is very close to her English teacher. That I feel like that's a a, a gay thing, you know, mm -hmm. trademark. Is Absolutely. That you, is that you're usually, in a non-weird way, very close to your English teacher. Particularly if you're a writer. It was good to see that trope done in a very non-uncomfortable way. As a teacher, I'm always very wary of movies that paint very boundaryless relationships with students and teachers as present these relationships and go, actually, this is very smart and very wonderful and very good. And I'm like, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very unhealthy dynamic, but no, I really like that this movie kept the boundaries of a student and a teacher, but also managed to show that they were very close. A lot of movies don't bother to do that, so I really liked yeah. that. What's our next point? Asians showing love through food. Oh, man. <laughs> I like that food was kind of a love language. 
in this movie. Actually, now that I've brought that up, I'm realizing that it actually really was. There's this really gay interaction with Ellie and Paul near the start of the movie, after they've written a few letters to Aster. He's like, when does the dating start? And Ellie's like, this is dating. <laughs> like, that's just very lesbian, Like, especially when you're that age, like just to be texting someone about like, your favorite things and your favorite books and things that you care about. Like, it, it really does feel like that. Like, this is the most you can get. But then Paul is like, you know, like, when do, when do like burgers and milkshakes and fries start? <laughs> that's, <laughs> I think that's really cute. And just, yeah, the taco sausage is also a way of Paul kind of, Showing I don't know, showing, and, yeah, and his creativity and also his love. And of course, there's like the really, oh, the scene. I, I was sobbing. <gasps> I was crying yes. in this scene where Ellie comes home and she sees her dad and he's and he's making these dumplings for her because um she's going to go to college and she's going to be on a train for six days. So he's making her six days worth of dumplings to eat. I love that they don't really say I love you. Like he's just doing this for her because he does love her. Food yeah. is a love language. Food is a love language, absolutely. In, especially <laughs> if you're from a house of color. Food is mm. how people show emotions. Yeah, we don't say I love you. Very rarely. <laughs> yeah. We don't say I love you. We very rarely hug, but like, have you eaten yet? Yes. Are you hungry? You know? It's like the biggest way to say I love you, you know? Yeah. Oh, you look hungry. Come and mm. eat. Oh, no, it was very lovely. That's a lot of a common theme. I don't know. It also made me think of not in a in the way that oh this is Netflix other Netflix's other Asian movie, but it also made me think of always be my maybe because food is a love language in that movie as well. Oh, but true. I think this movie did it in a nicer way. Yeah, I mean, I think always be my maybe is also nice in a different way. Yeah, I like. I, yeah. Well, they're two it's very a lot different. more intimate. Yeah, yeah, they're two very different movies for two very different audiences, so... Yeah, but I think yeah. um, it, both those movies get the Buddha's love language aspect of that culture right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I love all the food. Makes me hungry. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd watched it after I'd broken my fast, so Good. it wasn't too bad for me. But yeah, now I really want to try a taco sausage. People have been, like, inventing recipes after making this movie. Um, I know Alice has been, like, posting, like, recipes that people have made, like, inspired after watching this movie. Cute. But I'm like, none of these are halal. <laughs> I Someday know. I will make, like, a halal version of a taco sausage that I can eat. So we're going to talk about representation of homophobia and internalized homophobia. Because a lot of people are thinking that just because this movie doesn't have a happy ending of a romance that it's not gay but that's not the only way a movie can be gay this Mm -hmm. movie is very much about the very casual insidiousness i mean it's not even it's not even obvious really the homophobia of the town this is obviously a very religious town we know this from the beginning one of the first shots you see of the town is the church Mm mm-hmm and a lot of the scenes take place in the church. Obviously, Ellie, even even though she's not religious and she says that, she even partakes in the weekly town ritual of, of everyone going to church because she's the organ player at the church. Yeah. So that just should tell you just how much church is part of everyone's lives, the fact that Ellie's an atheist and still attends in some way. Because it's such a religious town, obviously a Christianity, some form of Christianity, it's very homophobic, but in a very quiet but still very strong way. And the scene that this is most obvious in is when Paul finally clocks the fact that Ellie lacks Asta. And the way he says to her in that moment, he's just like, oh, you're going to hell. And it's not even in a in a mean way. He's not even saying, yeah. like, you're going to hell. He's not even angry or anything he's just he actually is saying it with heartbreaking genuine concern oh you're going to hell you're going to hell if you told me d that you were going to move to i don't know you were going to move to perth or something i'd be like oh you're (gasps) going to perth (laughs) oh you're going to perth (laughs) (laughs) or like oh you're going to hobart (laughs) no (laughs) tragic (laughs) um but yeah Sorry, they're like own that those jokes are for Australians only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just sort of says it this concern and and he sort of walks away and you can tell in that moment that it's just ingrained in him in this way that it's natural for him to say that. It's not e- even something malicious. He just sees it as a fact. 
like it's something that he's is he's that he's internalized his whole life basically mm. and something ellie has internalized too i think which is why yeah. she doesn't articulate her like for aster or anything like that yeah and the the fact that she actually like actively ignores it um and makes excuses for herself um yeah i'm very i'm interested in the way that films manage to represent internalized homophobia in gay characters because it's something that i struggled with for a very long time and yeah i definitely like that this movie kind of shows there's a certain way that you just when you grow up in a place that is religious or just your brain is wired a certain way and you have to work to fix that when you do make these realizations about yourself and i i appreciate the film a lot for that yeah And I really like how with the internalised homophobia, you see that it's sort of detrimental to everyone in in its Mm. own way. Not to say it's equivalent to Ellie's sadness, but, Mm. you know, Paul thinks like, oh, I can't be friends with this person anymore. That makes him sad. And, you know, Ellie loses her friendship over it. And I think I I read a, a quote from Alice Wu that essentially what she wanted to do was make a film about what it was to break up with a friend. Yeah. And I think it's captured really well in that breaking up with a friend is it's pretty horrible. <laughs> it's pretty it horrible. It is. Um, like, you have all this emotional intimacy with a person and it's just suddenly gone. And, like, you're kind of not – you're not even kind of expected to process it in a way that you're known to process, like, romantic breakups. The grief of that is not often shown no. in film, so. And also, but I love how Paul – was still going and helping Mr. Chu. That's why I love that scene where he goes, oh, Ellie's been sad, he mm. tells Paul. That actually, like, I thought this during the scene, I was like, I love how this scene is playing out, like, if they'd broken up, if they were a romantic couple. But yeah. they're not a romantic couple, but it's still playing out that way because it honestly feels that way. Yeah, but like, it's diff- devastating because your heart is broken. Yeah, I really loved that, that part of the film because – it's not a thing that's often taken seriously. Like, how many teen films have you seen where the main character and their best friend break up over something and everyone laughs at them and it's sort of like, oh, my God, like, I'm not friends with her. How did you not know? You know, like, it's always mm. like a joke or something. Um, but I like that this film takes it seriously. And that scene with Paul and the dad is one of the nicest in the whole film. It's beautiful. It is really beautiful. I love, even though the dad is speaking Mandarin because he's not very confident with his English, Paul is listening so hard because he can he can feel what he's saying, which is really mm. nice. And I like that that interaction and the next thing it, it goes to is the final big scene in the church. And it's like that conversation with the dad has given him the strength to do what he does. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. It's just so nice and wholesome and, and just lovely like to have that strength. And I love... I love the church outburst scene. It is truly the best. Truly the best. I'm a big fan of the contagious outburst trope, you know, like when someone like, you know, stands up and says something dramatic and it gets everyone around them to within the society, not even like the main characters, just to start saying shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love that so much. And this happens in Saving Face as well, when the main character goes and crashes her mom's wedding. Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, I think this is something that Alice Wu likes as well. It's because it's it's so funny, but also it's so strong. And so like when they all stand up in the church and start like doing speeches at each other, it's so good. Like it, it really gets you. Yes, right it is so heart. And I also love how in this one, when mm-hmm. it happens, the priest is just like, thank you. That was very <laughs> odd. <laughs> because Paul's I love- just like, there are so many other ways to love. <laughs> And the priest is like, thank you, Paul. (laughs) And I just love it. I just love it because I love the trope of a character who's not familiar with what's been going in the main plot coming Mm -hmm. in on a a very random moment. And I love that that's the bit. And he's just sort of like, I have no clue what's happening here. And you like watch this whole unfold where Ellie's like, no, no. And everyone's like, um... What? Yeah. <laughs> when she like stood up and was like, no, I gasped. Like, <gasps> And I actually forgot that there's a scene like that in Saving Face. So uh, yeah, it's a, lo- it's a lovely little parallel. Yeah, it is a nice little parallel, I think. I think, am I, am I at my last point now? Are you up to your not gay enough point? Yes, 
I am. All right. Excellent. Let's do it. Okay. As I've said a few times before on Gay V Club, I don't really like romance, which is, of course, pretty contradictory as someone who is obsessed with gay cinema and who has a podcast where I talk about gay cinema because romance is, it's just like the easiest way to portray sexuality. But I do really love this film for portraying lesbianism specifically as a part of your identity, that it intersects with being an isolated immigrant minority. And I'm just so thankful for that. And it's weird because like since its release, even though the reception of the movie has been widely positive, I think the biggest complaint that I've seen, the biggest negative complaint that I've seen is that the movie isn't gay enough. Boo. I, it's really reductive, I think, to only acknowledge gayness when it's romantic and or sexual. It's kind of like those people that say love is love. Yeah. You know? It's like. I don't only exist when I'm in love with someone, you know, I'm still, I know. I'm, I'm still here. Being gay, like, it alters every part of you. And I'm a big fan of films that manage to explore sexuality without romance. Like, even though there is romance in this movie and it's super gay, I do love that this movie is extremely specific in showing Ellie's lesbianism as being part of her and not just through the act of pursuing another girl. Ellie is isolated socially and culturally, not just because she's a person of color, but also she very intentionally isolates herself. Kids at her school still know who she is, and it's not that she's shy exactly, because, you know, she runs an essay writing business, which I imagine requires her to have some rapport with them. Like, it's not that she's incapable of developing relationships with other people her age, it's that she deliberately keeps her interactions with them purely transactional. She even tries to do this with Paul when they start out. She's careful not to share any details about herself with anyone. And there's this feeling when you're closeted, if you let anyone know even a little bit about you, they might discover too much. So no one really knows her and no one even knew she could play guitar except Paul, who heard her through the window, which is why the talent show scene plays out like that. She loves all these books and films and they're full of queer subtext but she only feels safe talking about them with Aster when she's pretending to be Paul. Like she'd rather sit alone in a train booth no matter how cold it is because that's where she feels safest and even the fact that she wears so many layers of clothing like metaphorical as that is I think is as a literal styling choice I feel it's also very gay. Like I recognize so many of these things in myself and I know that Ellie is specifically like this because she is Gaijin. As someone who's grown up gay and closeted as a person of color in a Western country raised in an Asian family, <laughs> you've got you've got the repression of being gay and the repression of being Asian. Double whammy. <laughs> just slammed together in your stupid body. And it's it's a lot, okay? And um especially when you're 17. And I appreciate this movie so much for showing that so skillfully and maybe I am taking it a bit too personally but yes yeah, some some of you bitches <laughs> have been have like you know I've seen I've seen some things oh just like really to either it. either just like really people who hate the movie and people who like people who either hate the movie or people who just think it's like whatever they're just like, ah, oh, three stars, move on kind of movie. Especially because I've noticed that these people who are saying these things are white. And white I just... White demons, all of them. <sighs> it's actually kind of funny because ironically, remember when when the movie was, uh, when the trailer dropped and the way that the movie was being promoted, I was worried that it wouldn't be so gay, you know? Yeah, because they use Paul in the trailer a lot. Yeah, because they use Paul in the trailer a lot. Like, I was actually worried about this, but actually, you know, when I watched the movie, like, it was actually done in a way that then I, I found really out like. he was he was a he was himbo, and I was like, yay! Yes, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like the way that uh, I remember the Netflix Malaysia account released the trailer. And it's like not all love is romantic, and uh, it made me be like, oh no, is this movie gonna like uh -oh. completely like? fuck us over because i know that like netflix malaysia and netflix indonesia their social presences are very no homo just with a lot of their releases their the way that they promote movies specifically in that way so i had that fear as the movie was coming out but actually like now that i've seen it i honestly prefer this because you know who am i i don't i don't even like romance why would i <laughs> why would i want a huge 
part of romance. But back to the white people that are saying that this movie isn't gay enough. The white devils. Um, <laughs> there's a part in the celluloid closet where a filmmaker says something like, watching romance movies, I would always have to translate what was happening with the straight couples on screen to my life in order to relate to it. So when I started making movies, I was able to say to straight people, here, it's your turn to translate. I forget which filmmaker it is, but yeah, it's something that is said in the cellular closet. And I think this concept of like translation applies to race as well. I think people of yes. color are very used to having to translate the white stories that we see on screen to see how they fit into our lives. So like when a gay film with a white and usually American laid comes out um, we're supposed to kind of accept that as being a win for us as well and sometimes it honestly does feel like that as well but I feel like white people certainly aren't used to doing this translating like at all because historically they've never had to not just within LGBT cinema but within movies made and released in the west like they are the default like they always see themselves so they've obviously don't use they don't have to use their brain yeah They don't have to use their brains. They don't have to actually be like, huh, how can I actually relate to this character that's very different to me? They don't have empathy. Can I just say there's actually been psychological studies done on this that why people generally have less empathy than people of color because they've never – no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not even kidding you. They've actually done psychological studies. I mean, I believe it, but also (laughs) – It's it's like a generational ingrained Mm -hmm. thing. Because not only do you in your current era, that your current body that you are living in, if you are white, not only in that instance do you not have to care as much about other people, but mm. that has been taught to you, you know, yeah, by previous generations. So it's like an intergenerational psychological horror. So, so yeah, I, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that that white people just can't empathize with people of color in movies. That's not just because they're used to seeing themselves in movies. That's because they genuinely can't empathize with people of color, wow. with people that don't look like them. They genuinely can't do it. They're... Once <laughs> once they're adults, they found like different results in children because kids don't have the same biases generally when they're younger. Mm. That makes sense. But yeah, I feel like when, when white people watch something like The Half of It or The Handmaiden or even Moonlight, I think at best they'll often, I've noticed the way they'll often call these movies quote unquote important, but they won't mm. actually like them. They'll th- they'll be like, oh yeah, this is not for me. And it's true. Like even though movies like with this kind of representation, movies like the half of it, even though it's not specifically made for white people to watch, like there's still something that you can absolutely learn from the movie anyway. There are still like very universal experiences that you can see and relate to that I think apply to everyone. Um, oh, hell and, yeah. also, and like things that you know will i guess enrich your perspective and help you to think about other people like no offense but if i can watch a, a movie about a white teenager and still find something to relate to in it like i'm sure you can too yeah like if i can watch a movie about some french lesbians in the fucking i don't know 17th century and be like <laughs> oh my god this is me yeah <laughs> like you, you like you just have to do the work. Like I'm so used to having to translate. Why can't you do this? And why can't you like it's so it's and it's sad like to see the dismissal of these people that won't translate it. Yeah. Like if I can watch that a won't movie, make this cultural like translation. Like if I can watch a movie about Elton John and be like, Oh, I relate to this <laughs> Like I'm sure you can do it. Yeah. So yeah, I think people who are saying this it's, it's sad to see the film being dismissed this way not not too many people are doing it anyway and that's good but like that's that's just my main gripe with the reception of this movie and the things i've seen and it's a good gripe say. it's a it's a worthy gripe again like it's not even as if the movie isn't the way that they regard this stuff as being not gay enough it's kind of like Everything about Ellie's identity and like her behavior is very much because she's very specifically gay, very specifically Asian in this specific setting. So yeah, if you if you actually bother to translate, you would realize that. And I think I think we should encourage that translation in things because specific stories are very important, and specificity is how you get to say the really important things. Allyship means nothing without empathy. It really means nothing for you to say. Representation is important if you're not going to empathize and understand why. And the easiest place to practice empathy, because it is such an important thing, 
is by watching movies made by people who don't look like you or don't live like you. Literally just empathize. And TV hmm. and, and movies is a great place to practice your empathy in a very relaxing way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't even have to go out. In a way that's very harmless. You don't even have to worry about, like, stuffing up. Yeah. Like, how can um, you watch something wrong? <laughs> yeah, you can't. You can't watch something wrong. So, I mean, you can watch it wrong if you don't translate, if you don't do this cultural mm. translation. That's the only way. Allyship is nothing unless you have actual empathy. And if you mm -hmm. can't manage that, even sympathy is good. I would not say that the movie isn't gay enough. I would say it's very gay, especially for like the kind of setting and the kind of audience that it's for. Like These are teens that literally don't know what love is, and I think that all the interactions between Ellie and Astro are just like so incredible. <laughs> I just so like it's really funny the way that they're written and also like really nice and there is of yeah. course you know the the iconic hot spring scene oh yes we haven't even talked about that scene we yet. haven't even talked about that so yeah I was I was I specifically brought it up this way so that we could talk about it last oh, good. Good. um two girls chilling in the hot spring <laughs> chilling in the hot five spring. feet apart because they are gay because they are <laughs> Mary came up with this title for the episode and I was laughing for like five whole minutes <laughs> <laughs> yes i can't believe that alice Wu really did this i don't know if she was thinking about that iconic vine when she wrote this scene but it's possible mm -hmm. it's possible but yeah what a pretty scene the way it's filmed and honestly like i cannot believe that asta has had one conversation irl with ellie and she's like i'm gonna take you to my super secret special place like how gay of you <laughs> i know but yeah that's the thing like she gets the vibe from ellie what she feels like the wavelength that she's on when she's messaging quote unquote paul she recognizes that in ellie and that's how she becomes that's how she's so immediately familiar and i like that and i like the way that the movie slows down there me too i really love the music in that scene as well and I mm. love the line even though I'm not quite sure what it means but I love mm -hmm. the line gravity is matter's response to loneliness and then when she says that when Ellie says that her head like moves closer to Aster it's really sweet yeah um, they just like float they just yeah. floating <laughs> it's floating it's just real nice and I love how they swap clothes in that scene I also love the way that they're treated. A lot of the time in shows about teenagers, obviously the actors aren't teenagers for, for various reasons, but I still love the way that Alice Wu was like, no, this is a movie about teenagers, they're going to act like teenagers, and I'm going to film them like they're teenagers. So, you know, you don't see nudity or anything like that. Like, it's very wholesome. It's very much, you know. and It's I love very much, like, actually made for teens. Yeah, it's actually made like for Like a teens. movie with teenage characters that's actually made for teenagers to watch. Mm -hmm. And when something is actually made for a certain group of people, I feel like you, everyone can watch it knowing that mm. and it's much easier to watch. Unlike a lot of teen media, which I watch and I sort of go, who is this actually for? <laughs> mm. Because I don't know if teens would understand this. And Anyway. But no, I feel like that scene is very beautiful. Oh, my one gripe, and you did explain to me after listening to the commentary that she has some <laughs> special air spray on her glasses, but as someone with with glasses, I was very frustrated watching that scene because Ellie's glasses do not fog up once in the hot spring, <laughs> and I was so annoyed. I was like, how? on? It's like that friggin' goddamn scene in Goblet of Fire and Harry's wearing his glasses in the bath. This bitch, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> I love that scene and I love that Ellie talks about her mum in that scene when we haven't really mm. heard her be able to talk about her mum. And yeah. I love how that's the best bit in the movie. Yeah, and they if actually you know call, they're mean. like, this is the best part. And they were right. Like, were it's right. so good. But also I love how the love in that scene is associated with her mum because we haven't heard Ellie be able to talk about her mum like all movie. Yeah. And then she can talk about it there and it's like all the different kinds of love converging on one scene. It's very nice. Yes, that's true. And as I said, even though I don't like romance, I love that there's that really deep understanding that Ellie and Esther have and you can really feel that. You love a good knowing. I love me some knowing. 
<laughs> also, I do really love that Joan Chen is the mom, even though she doesn't appear in the movie, like she appears in photos. Joan Chen was also in Alistair's last film at playing the mom, so it's a nice like call back to that. Aww. Thank you, lesbian ally Joan Chen. The Alice Wu Cinematic Universe. The Alice Wu Joan Chen is your mom cinematic universe. <laughs> I hope to see more of it. I would like to see. <laughs> yes, we would all like to see more of it. Was there anything else? What is this? Give me one good movie kiss and I'll be all right. Oh yeah, I was going to talk about the kiss scene in that way. Like that made me that really did make me feel like <laughs> another gripe about people saying that <laughs> that the movie wasn't gay enough. First of all, like Ellie is a lesbian character and she's like on screen the whole time. Mm-hmm. It reminds me kind of of that Hannah Gadsby Netflix special where Nanette where she's talking about how like she received some feedback after a show she's like there wasn't enough lesbian content and she's like but I was on sh- on the stage the whole time <laughs> this is a film about a lesbian directed by a lesbian like how is it not enough lesbian content and also something that I do think is just extremely lesbian is the kiss scene very specifically lesbian in that you know like they have like one good movie kiss and then she's just like I'll see you in a couple years like that was that was good like that's a very like triumphant moment and also just I do I do relate to that on a personal level like that specific kind of interaction I found it really funny but also really sweet Aster I don't know about Aster's like if Aster is gay or if Aster is bi I mean she's gonna go to art school and obviously she's gonna figure that out so we know that she's gonna we know that that character is gonna figure that out eventually which is nice and I like that Ellie gives her that encouragement to pursue her art as well. Yeah, the knowing. But yeah, I do like that <laughs> shot of Ellie riding away on her bike and she's at peace. Give me yeah. one good movie kiss and I'll be all right. I and love she's all that right. Shot. Like, you know that like, she's all right. I when love you that see shot that. looking up at Ellie as she's riding her bike and it's like looking up at her face mm. and the sky is moving past her. It's a really pretty yeah. shot. I actually didn't, I don't know, I, I blocked the tag on things so I didn't see anything. I actually didn't think they'd kiss, and I wasn't expecting it, and so it's just a nice surprise. Yeah, I wasn't actually expecting it at that point in the movie. I don't know if I even care about the romance. (laughs) Like, obviously I care about the connection that they have, but I don't know if I care about the romance. Like, I know people have been like, oh, we need to see, you know, the other half of it, where they do get together. I'm like, I don't need to see that, because... I don't want their babies. Like you said at the beginning... This movie is about how they've had a very big impact of their lives and like these three characters coming together and having this really important connection and then going their separate ways. If you want to watch some content where some teens get together, despite the fact that they probably shouldn't be, just because it gives the movie a happy ending, you can just watch To All the Boys I Love Before Part 2. <sighs> that movie confuses well, me so much. literally any other teen movie. Literally any other teen movie. But I just want to say, like, I, I'm so confused yeah, that's about a recent all the example. boys I've loved before part two, because that movie spends a whole movie telling you how Lara Jean really doesn't want a boyfriend. She really doesn't enjoy She really she's isn't ha- emotionally ready to have a boyfriend. She, yeah, she's not having a good time at all. Maybe, maybe I sound old saying this, but like, yeah, she's she's not ready for it. Like, you, And you Honestly. don't have to be. But I'm not. And but like, I don't it would have been nice. You're not saying that, like, it is as an older person. We're saying that as two people who watched the movie and watched how stressed she was this whole movie. I'm like, girl, yeah. just, just don't. You don't need yeah, to have a boyfriend. When I was a teenager, I did feel the way kind of Lara Jean, like th- that kind of obligatory way. Like, yeah, I should have a boyfriend. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, boom, ching. And we all know how that turned out. <laughs> I don't know. I literally never had that. I literally, I'm, I'm, ne- I'm really I was happy never for you that you didn't. I was like, nah, because it sounds stupid. It's a very, it's a very toxic way to think when you're growing up, and like you're not really taught anything else. So I think the half of it is a gift in that sense even though it's positive and like like it doesn't make you feel like you have to end up with someone or like you have to have like a romantic relationship with someone like sometimes it's nice to just to just vibe with someone and to you know have intelligent conversations and be like the same intellectual wavelength as them and change the each other's lives in that way yeah. uh, in a significant way but it doesn't have to be I can't think of another word consummated. <laughs> I it guess with have a romantic to be like relationship, an shifting romance to do that. No, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be romantic to do that. It, it doesn't need to be solidified with a confirmed romance. Again, sometimes you just need one good movie kiss, and that's it. Exactly. Okay, I have some points now. Yes, my first point. 
Because <laughs> Dee and I both wrote some points for this movie, and my first point is simply Paul is Steve's boyfriend. <laughs> now, to elaborate. Steve who? <laughs> okay. <laughs> to elaborate. We haven't really, I mean, we do talk about Stranger Things on this podcast, but in passing most of the time. But, you know, we watch Stranger Things like the rest of the world. And I believe, as many others do, and you believe too, D, that um, Steve Harrington is, is, is bi. Yeah, but the problem with that is that there are no other characters no, his age that you can really, that's... that you want him to be with, except for fucking Jonathan and fucking, what's his name? The racist guy? Billy. Except for Jonathan and Billy. Like, it's so, and it's so sad. <laughs> There simply aren't enough characters in Stranger Things. Just side note, like, I think it's really weird the way that people ship Robin and Nancy, even though they've literally never interacted, just because they're the only two girls of the same age in that show. Yes. It's stupid. Like, it is really Stranger stu- Things is so stupid for many Sometimes, reasons. Sometimes, occasionally, I see people, because I, I follow people who posted, like, Steve content, because Steve mm-hmm. is, is the best in Stranger yeah. Things. And I had to block all these ship tags with Steve because people ship Steve in the worst scenarios. People ship Steve with Billy. And I'm like, he literally wanted to kill this guy. He carried around a bat in the back of his car for a year in case he ran into this guy. And honestly, who wouldn't? (laughs) But that's not in canon. But people were like, why did Steve carry around that bat in his car? In, in Stranger Things 3. Like, in Stranger Things he... Season 3, they don't even explain to Steve that that Billy has been possessed by the alien thing. Like, <laughs> no, Steve I... is just like, oh, yeah, this guy who I hate? Yeah, yeah. let's. we absolutely have to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because who wouldn't? If Billy lived in my town, I would, abs- I would absolutely carry around a bat in the back of my car. And mm-hmm. anyway, getting beside the point... <laughs> Because there is no viable boyfriends for Steve his own age in Hawkins, I am I am often on the lookout for what would be the type of boy that Steve would have as a boyfriend. And as soon as Paul came into this movie and I just saw what a what a beautiful, wholesome himbo he was, I was like, This this is Steve's boyfriend. <laughs> And um, that's it. That's all I have to say. That's that's that point. Yep. My next point. This is a trend I think that Netflix is doing where they have a character, the main character in a show, or not the main character, but there is a character in a show who is a lesbian and then they their best friend. There's a character in a show who is a lesbian and then they have a best friend who's their partner in crime who is a wholesome himbo. And this trend, well, I think the first Netflix thing that it – is trope, you mean? Oh, okay, yeah, trope. Yeah, that's a better word for it. Or it's becoming a trope. It's becoming a trend. That's why I said it was trend. But yeah, mm-hmm. this trope now becoming a trend. Um, like first appeared in Stranger Things, obviously, with the iconic duo of, of Robin and Steve, which I love. The only reason I can't wait for season four is because I want to see more of them. And then the next time it happened was in I'm Not Okay With. Is that show I'm Not Okay With This? Is that what yes. it's called? The full side, yeah. okay. And there's Sydney and Stanley, and now we have we have finally a a, a duo that is not um all white. And we have Ellie and Paul, and I love that. And I think part of the reason I love that <laughs> is because I honestly feel like in in my heart um that you and I are this duo, D. <laughs> Like you are the very Stop, cool. You're making me cry. <laughs> you are you are the very cool like lesbian, and I am. I'm not a himbo, but I'm bimbo friend who is dumb of heart. We are reclaiming bimbo, so the B I in bimbo is stands for like the fact that she's bi. Hell yeah. yeah. Yes. So yeah, that's why I think I love this dynamic because I'm like. I mean, I don't me. think you are a bimbo anyway. I think you're really super smart anyway. But I am super smart, but I I'm not smart all the time. I turn it off sometimes, and I'm just. I'm so just, do I. Yeah, that's just how I roll. But yeah, I think yeah. that's why I love this dynamic because I'm like, that's me and my friend. But yes, so that's what I have to say on that point. Oh, so my next point, which I think will actually be my last point because we've done all my other points so one thing I wanted to say being I don't know I guess I'm a slightly problematic person like everyone but you know I 
I love. You like Monte Carlos. Oh, don't bring this up. You know, okay. you, sta- you started a whole discourse in my house. We've been dis- debating biscuits because I was so upset. <laughs> I was so upset that you said you didn't like Monte Carlos. I was telling my mom. It's not and that I hate them. Like, I'll still eat them. If my dad there. was like, I don't like Monte Carlos. And I was like, what? That's right. He's right. Sometimes your dad is right. <laughs> so, yes, uh, f- fine. Don't tell him that, though. It'll go, hit, to go to his head. I can't let him hear that. But anyway, yep. problematic fave. I do like John Green books. He wrote one of my favorite books, which is Turtles All the Way Down. But one of the reasons I like John Green books, and I probably, you know, like most people, mostly love them as a teenager or, you know, late teenager, is because in John Green books, I feel like a lot of what he does, particularly in Turtles All the Way Down, which is my favorite book, is being, he sort of imagines parts of his teenagehood and is like kinder to himself retroactively. So Turtles All the Way Down, for anyone who hasn't read it, is about um, this girl who has OCD. Well, she suffers from it pretty badly and her her ritual, which is pretty it's pretty intense she she's like obsessed with hand sanitizer and it gets so bad sometimes that she like drinks it oh my god yeah so it's really um intense and this was actually something that john green experienced like as a teen like he had undiagnosed ocd and he like was very much obsessed with hand washing and being clean and all that kind of stuff anyway what i really love about this book though and the way he talked about it was it was sort of what he wished the people around him had been like when he had OCD growing up and it doesn't necessarily have a happy ending the book like it's nothing intense it's not like she dies or anything but she has to get really really bad before she starts realizing she needs to get better but one thing John Green talked about in a lot of interviews was you know in his books he, he loves to he loves to pick like an aspect of his teenagehood that he felt was unresolved and sort of take it seriously in his books and be like well, how would I have liked to have read about this thing that happened to me as a teenager? How would I have liked to have seen it in a way that was taken seriously? Because a lot of times in stuff made for teens, it's trivialized, like stuff that's important to teenagers is trivialized. And what I love about this movie is it has that same feel to it. Things that normally are trivialized in a lot of other teen movies aren't in this movie. That idea of breaking up with a friend or having a lot on your plate or it's just got that feel to it that I think a lot of John Green books do, which is essentially taking teenagers seriously, but not in a scandalous way. Not in a way like euphoria way where like, oh, we're going to treat teens like adults. It's more like we're going to treat teens like teens as people, but people who are still teens. I don't know. I felt like this this movie really reminded me of a John Green book, but in a really nice way, in in the way that it took being a teen seriously in every sense of it. It treated the things that were silly as silly. It treated the things that were that were serious as serious and overall it was just very kind to teens yeah which I having this setting like everything these characters learns like it's treated with such kindness yes and that you um, don't see in a lot of movies like I know a lot of people have issues with his books and I understand that and I don't think I'm not trying to tell you that he's a perfect writer and that you know his books are actually genius I'm not trying to say that at all but one of the things that I loved about his books when I was a teen and even now is is this kindness and compassion towards being a teenager and, and being a teen and I saw that in this movie too and I think that's really lovely and it's not something that you see very often in teen media even teen media that's sort of trying to be like we're taking teenagers as real and realistic still not being kind or compassionate and I love that this movie is kind and compassionate because Alice Wu talked about how she made this movie in part as a response to an experience she had growing up where where one of her best friends stopped being friends with her it made me feel like this movie was a a sort of retroactive kindness to herself by acknowledging that mm. that that happened and that was really horrible and maybe giving it a different ending, you know, because Paul and Ellie obviously are friends at the end of the movie again. 
But yeah, that's yeah. what it, it made me think of the way John Green treats teens with kindness and treats his own teenagehood with kindness. That's what um, this movie made me think of. And I'm paying that as a compliment. I know a lot of people wouldn't see a comparison to John Green as a compliment, but coming from me, because I really like that about his books, it's a very okay. big thing. But yeah, that's my um, that's my final point. I just love movies about teens that are actually that actually care about teens, basically. Not just caring about teens as as potential profit, but actually like, hey, this is a teen this is a movie we want teens to see because it's important. So yeah, I give this movie four stars out of five. Well, I give it four and a half. Nice. Mostly just because I, I like I watched Saving Face again recently and Saving Face is undoubtedly like a solid four. And this was better than Saving Face, I think, even though even though it's weird to say because they're for different uh, audiences and stuff. I actually don't have a complaint about it. Like, I could even say that it's a five, but I, I don't know. I'm very, I'm very. <laughs> I struggle with giving movies four and a half, five. <laughs> so, you gotta so let f- more love into your heart, Mary. I know. I gotta. My mom's <laughs> always telling me I'm a cynic, and I'm like, ah. I do really love this movie. Um, I love this movie. It's everything that I hoped for, even though it's not what I was expecting at all. Like, it's what maybe that's it's, why you it's love what it. we deserve. It's what we deserve, I think. Um, and it's it really is like a gift, and it really is so so kind. It's nice to me, a twenty three year old watching this movie and seeing it. Like, this is definitely a movie that teenage me would have found really helpful. And I oh. like the idea that this movie is definitely going to be really helpful to any teenagers watching it. Um, I have, and I I like have that... a question. Yeah. Do you, do you ever get like jealous when movies like these come out for teens and you're like, man, I wish I had that? Or do you just. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do, I do feel it a little bit, but I think overall, like, like I'll think first, damn, I wish I had this. But then my next thought will be, I'm so glad that younger people today do have this. I feel that way, whatever any big gay movie comes out you know even if it's like a varying degrees of quality sometimes they're still like what you need to watch at this age because I wouldn't say a lot of my favorite movies are even that great I would just say that I watched them at a very specific time in my life where it was you know really impressionable and also it affected me or like it impacted me in a very specific way because of the way that I was feeling at that age I think that's everyone's favorite movies though I think that's why showing people your favorite movie is never what you think it's gonna be yeah. Because you realize, oh, this person is not going through what I went through when I was watching mm-hmm. this movie. Yeah. I'll tell my friends, yo, this movie I really love is bad, but I need you to watch it so you can understand my psychological issues. <laughs> but no, I like that some young gay people are going to watch this and see themselves and can have that impression on them. The half of it is so much nicer than some of the movies I watched at that age that weren't very good for me and were actually quite harmful for me to have been watching at that age so it's just a relief when I see films like this that maybe the problems I had back then might be a little bit easier on teens watching it now but yeah having a film like this when I was growing up would have been really helpful when I was finishing high school I would obsessively watch coming of age movies hoping that they might articulate what I was feeling or or even show me what to do at this time of my life because I had no clue and they would just make me even more depressed because they'd end and I'd be like, I can't do this. I'm like, I'm not white. I'm not, I'm not Shailene Woodley. So, so I like that Ellie's sexuality is portrayed in this very specific way for Gaijins through her everyday behavior, not just through her romantic interactions in a way that's not super overt, but still present. Mary and I are relatively confident in our identities. So we watch this movie and we kind of laugh and go like, this is so gay of her, but it's not extremely obvious for everyone, and I can imagine people watching this movie and not realizing until even Paul does. It's funny because there is a scene maybe halfway through the movie before he realizes when Ellie starts to list all the reasons she likes Asta, and she catches herself because she's so scared that Paul is going to realize what she is, and you can see the fear in her eyes, but it doesn't even occur to him. It's not just internalized homophobia. Gayness is... It can be something that you're just completely oblivious to, it, that it doesn't even occur to you. And I think what I love most about this movie coming out is the thought of a young teenager watching Ellie behave the way she does, hiding herself the way she does in this extremely specific way, and seeing themselves in her. And when the penny drops, finally, in this movie, possibly 
realizing things about themselves that may never have occurred to them before. I do like also just that this is an accessible movie. I listened to Alice Wu on a podcast called Query. I feel like whenever established filmmakers release a Netflix film, they're always asked like, oh, why would you go to Netflix? Because that's a whole thing that I don't want to get into now. But yeah, Alice Wu, she liked that, like, this is, you know, obviously a very important movie that would be helpful for a lot of people to see, not just the kinds of people that it's about. If you had a theatrical release, not many people would go to see it. Not many people would choose to go out and like watch a movie like this, but in the privacy of their homes, they would feel comfortable hitting play on a story like this. That's so true. Yeah. You know, streaming distribution is a has a whole load of issues, but this is something nice that came from it. Yes. Well, I never thought of it like that, but that's so true. Mm. There are definitely just certain movies that certain kinds of people wouldn't go to see. And also not just for those non-white non-LGBT audiences, but also just for young gay people who may be closeted, who don't feel safe going out to see movies like that because it can still be dangerous. Access is important. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can really have the conversation about representation without talking about access. No, God no. Empathy and access, two key things. I have one final thought. I really like how this movie, and I wrote this in my letterbox review, but I really like how this movie it juggles so much, like at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like it juggles so much, but it does it so gracefully. You don't even really notice how much is in this movie, but you do. It's just handled in a way that's like so natural. You don't feel like things are just being thrown at you. Mm-hmm. And I just love how this movie is, is realistic, but at the same time it's optimistic as well. And that's yeah. really hard to do because a lot of people yeah. think being realistic is being pessimistic. That's true. But it's not. It can be being optimistic as well. It just depends on the way your characters see their situation. And yeah, I just love how this movie is so complex and you can see the complexity of it or you can just see it as a really lovely, simple movie that's... Yeah, like it's really fun and goofy Mm -hmm. still. Like we're talking about it in quite a serious context, but this is like a very feel-good, corny movie, which I love and I think it's very important. I think it's also important as well for younger gay people to have access to age-appropriate content for themselves, and it's nice that this movie has that, and again, with the whole coming-of-age genre, I like that the ending feels like a beginning, and I think that's something that's important to see. I think we were going to talk about similar films. Just to end, we were going to talk about similar films. So if you liked the half of it, watch... Pariah? Yes. By Dee Rees is beautiful. I think it has a similar ending. It's a lot heavier than the half of it, but it's definitely just a beautiful, beautiful film. Something that I was reminded of while watching the half of it was Billy Elliot as well, where the ending feels like a beginning. Same way with Pariah. Another one is Saturday Church. We love Saturday Church. What's her name? Isn't it in that movie from Pose? What's her name? Oh yeah, MJ Rodriguez is in yes. Saturday Church. Also, India Moore is there as well. It's yeah. such a good movie. I love that movie. Also, I know the Love, Simon comparison is, is a bit tired and maybe we've been a bit harsh on Love, Simon in the past on this podcast, but I would recommend the book that Love, Simon is based on because if you liked the exchanges between Ellie and Astor through their letters and such, um, you would love reading uh, Simon versus the Homo Sapien. I think that's the title, or Simon versus the Homo Sapien Agenda, or yeah, something. That's it. That's it. The letters between him and Blue are really sweet, and you get to the emails between them are really sweet. You read them, and the, it's like the cutest shit ever. Like <laughs> it's so wholesome. Also, like that book is like a perfect slice of time of 2012 Tumblr, which is kind of bad, but also pretty funny to read if It'll you were nostalgic. on the internet during that time. It does feel a little bit John Greeny, and I mean that kind of in a negative way at times. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's it's worth reading. Also, yeah, watch Saving Face if you haven't. Alice Wu is great. She is great. Which I hope Netflix gives her a couple of films, you know? I hope she wants to make more films. And Yeah. Or she yeah. maybe she'll just go back to her mysterious job in tech. <laughs> I don't know if it's mysterious. I just didn't research that far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. What are we doing next episode? What are we doing next episode? Are we going to talk about Hollywood? Yes. yes yeah we are okay so next episode we're going to talk about hollywood and also the seven husbands of evelyn hugo and also bojack horseman 
Yes, The Seven Husbands of Ev- Evelyn Hugo is a book, by the way. Not a, yes. not a, not a show. Um, it's a book by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And we're going to talk about the way, obviously, the three, the things that these three texts have in common is that they're about Hollywood and the way Hollywood treats people and also treats marginalized people, people. marginalized people and how it also in their industry. can aggravate power dynamics between people in a really horrible way. <laughs> if you uh, want to, please watch Hollywood on Netflix because we will be talking about that and reviewing that. If you haven't, watch a bit of BoJack Horseman. And, yes. you know, if you're a quick reader, try and find Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and give it a read. I'm the slowest reader ever, but I read Evelyn Hugo in like one night. Like I devoured that Same. Book. I read it two days, really. It's just a very quick read because it's it's very entertaining, mm. I think. So, yeah, uh, we're going to talk about that next episode. So thank you for listening to Gay V Club. Again, if you like us, please like, subscribe, rate, leave a nice review on wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell your friends. We also have a PayPal and Patreon. Patreon.com slash Gay Club. And we'll link those in the description thingies anyway. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, and we also have a YouTube channel for anyone who needs closed captions. So everyone be safe and thank you for listening and think of others, you know. All right. Watch something nice. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.